Okay. Well, let's get started. I'm uh, Matthew Pancook. I'm the director here at Seward County Community College Area Technical School Library, and this is our first lunch in the library for the 2013-2014 academic year. So welcome. Uh, today's presentation is a photographer's work in the work of Western Kansas by Jim Hoy. And this presentation is brought to you by the Kansas Humanities Council, a nonprofit organization promoting understanding of the history and ideas that shape our lives and strengthen our sense of community. So that we may enjoy, all enjoy the program, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. So, and then some of you who have uh, got a, a little flyer about Jim, I'll just go ahead and touch real quick on, on what it probably says in your flyer. Jim Hawley received his PhD in medieval English literature from the University of Missouri at Columbia, and he's currently a professor of English and the director of the Center for Great Plains Studies at Emporia State University. He's published 12 books and over 100 articles, and he's the co-author of Plains Book, a syndicated newspaper column. Jim is also part of the Kansas Historical History Humanities Council, mm -hmm. Kansas Humanities Council's reading program. So, and he's also been a charter member of the Kansas Humanities Council Speakers Bureau since 1985. Thanks, Kevin. Jim Boyd. Thank you. Thank you. This is a Speakers Bureau program from the Kansas Humanities Council, and it's about this man you see on the screen there, Francis Marion Steele, who's active in this part of the state back in the late, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, he was born in 1866, uh, I think just close to St. Louis, Missouri, maybe just across the line. His father died when he was very young. His mother took a job as a housekeeper for a minister in Missouri. By age 14, he was working for a photographer in Kansas City. And in 1890, he shows up in Dodge City with, and acquires a horse and buggy and mounts a big boxy thing with his camera equipment on it. He used glass plates to take his photographs and headed out into the southwestern uh, Kansas Oklahoma Panhandle, Texas Panhandle, Southeast Colorado area to take photographs of uh, cowboys at work out on the open range. Uh, can... Yeah, this picture is of, uh, out of the Big Basin area, St. Mm -hmm. Jacob's Well, there in Western Clark County. It's uh, pretty typical of many of his pictures. He really knew how to frame a picture, how to compose a picture. Most of his photographs have uh, a human in them. Not all of the most. Uh, he considered himself an artist, not a documentarian, but his great value today is how he documented life in this area back at that time period. And when the open range closed and they began to plow up the range and plant wheat, how he documented that change from uh, ranching to crop agriculture and then small town life, uh, uh, various construction projects, things like that. But uh, he, his work today is greatly valued for that. This picture here was taken uh, on the Grimes Ranch in Clark County, and it shows all the elements necessary for the. Uh, would you want to see if they could cut these lights out here? It might help them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, all the elements necessary for a trail drive from Texas to Kansas in the old days. You got the cattle in the background, and you have the. Um, the Bermuda, the horse herd in the foreground, and a couple of chuck wagons there in the midground. This is actually on a roundup down in that area. It says this is titled Outlaw Steer, and he titled Outlaw Steer, and he must be a pretty bad steer. They got three, four ropes on him, and all those ropes are tight. Uh, notice also down in this corner, copyright, copyright by FM Steel. His name, he put his name on many of his photographs and or sometimes on the frame around the photograph. <clears throat> it's not always there, but it is many times. Interestingly, sometimes it's S-T-E-E-L, sometimes it's S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. It's a real, his name was spelled with an E, final E, but it doesn't always get, uh, that final E doesn't always make it to his photographs. This one, uh, he called uh, Dehorning a Bull. I believe this one is down in the Texas Panhandle. I like to 
We'll call this one, how many cowboys does it take to demon the bull? And actually it takes one or two on the ground and one or two on the horses, but what he was doing was getting those other cowboys lined up there. He can sell more photographs that way. He was an itinerant photographer from what I can tell and <clears throat> made money in that, in that early period by photographing cowboys on the range and then trying to sell them photographs. Just as many times, if you live in the country, somebody will knock on your door and they're representing an airplane pilot who has taken a photograph of your homestead, your ranch stead or whatever, and is trying to sell you a photograph. And he did that. We know that happened because, or I think we can deduce that that happened because 25 of his photographs ended up in Greenwood County in the Flint Hills. I don't know why, but three of them ended up uh, near Fort Scott. Little town called Kincaid, and they're held at the Pittsburgh State University Library there. And I always kind of wondered how in the world they get back there, but uh, found out that the man that had those photographs was from Kincaid, Kansas, lived on a farm there. When he was a young boy or young man in his late teens, early twenties, he worked on a ranch in the open panhandle. And Steele shows up, takes the photos, he buys two or three of them, and and he goes back home, spends the rest of his life back in, um, in Bourbon County, and he took those photos with him. So he's out there selling photos to cowboys, and later on, uh, people would commission him to photograph their ranch, their farm, their house, various things like that. A um, couple of cowboys got a steer roped out there, a heifer roped out there in Ashland, in Clark County. And here's a nice photograph uh, around the chuck wagon. He took a lot of chuck wagon photographs. That's where cowboys would congregate at uh, meal time. And it not only documents what chuck wagon life was like, but it he also more chance to sell those photos. But we see the bed rolls here. We see the chuck wagon. We see the uh, horse herd being held behind that rope barrier, that little temporary corral made by Larry a rope. You can see it maybe across the horses, uh, across the chest there. Yeah. <clears throat> Notice that these cowboys, the genuine thing, don't look much like Don Wayne or Clint Eastwood, or, but this shows us what they actually wore, the kind of clothing they wore, the kind of equipment they used, what a chuck wagon, uh, how a chuck wagon was outfitted, uh, very well documented the lifestyle. This is down the Texas Panhandle. They're catching some horses. You notice there they, they tie one end of that rope to a chuck wagon wheel, string some others around there. Notice the rope is so low that those horses could easily just step over it, but they're trained well enough, they've done it often enough, but they stay where they're supposed to until they, until they get the one caught that they want, being saddled up there in the morning. This one is uh, Southwest Kansas, I'm not quite sure where. Uh, notice the eggshells lying around there. I assume this is the breakfast time. I particularly like this photo. You can see the chuck box here very nicely. You can see what that's like. But I want you to look at this horse here, especially. And my son and his wife run the Flying W Ranch in Chase County. It's a 7,000 acre cattle ranch, and they also do agritourism. But Few years, he's a good cook. My son's a good cook. He decided he wanted to get involved in these chuck wagon cooking contests, so he bought a chuck wagon that had gone from Texas to North Platte, Nebraska in 1880, 80, 80 something, and outfitted it and went down to Winfield, Kansas, to they had about a dozen to 15 chuck wagons from Kansas and uh, Oklahoma, a couple from Texas in the contest. They made all the same ingredients and cooked them up, and then they judge them. They had their wagon there, they judge them on the authenticity of the wagon and the cooking. He came in last. Uh, they said his cooking was good, but his, his wagon wasn't authentic because he didn't have the lanterns left. But, you know, it's 10 in the morning. And you know, out on the range, as soon as it got light enough, they blew out the lantern. They weren't going to let it waste coal oil during the daytime. But the thing they got on him for was he had his saddle horse tied to the front wheel of the wagon. And you might not be able to see it there, but this horse has a, a a rope loop down here going up the front wheel of the wagon. Uh, and they told him nobody had to do that in the old days. They jerked the wagon and so they graded him down 
He's never entered another one that's kind of soured him on every stove he's cooked, though. But